Christians fare only slightly better than that. In looking at the ancient history of Israel, there is one person who stands out by whom all the kings of Judah and Israel are compared to. One king out of all those kings. David. King David. Turn, if you would, to Acts 13.22. We're going to jump a little bit in Scripture today. That's why I didn't read a particular passage. We're going to be jumping a little bit, so it's going to help, us, help you stay awake and stay focused. Okay? At Acts 13, 22. And it says, And when he had removed him, he raised him up unto them, David, to be their king to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine heart, which shall fulfill all of my will. God anointed David because of his heart. And the knowledge he had of God but that heart and that, and, and, and God says in this, at the end of this verse, this verse, which shall fulfill all of my will. You know, we are told that God raised David up to be the king of Israel, and he did. And he gave this testimony that we read there in verse, in verse 22. We're not going to turn to all these verses, but I want to read to you some of these verses. You can write them down and look them up for yourselves. Psalm 53, verses uh, 2 and 3, it says, God looked down from heaven upon children of men to see if there were any that did understand and did seek God. He looked down and looked to find out if anybody knew who he was and that they were continuing to seek after him. And every one of them is gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And we've heard that also. Paul writ the same thing. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seek after God. They are gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Romans 3, 10 through 12. You know, you think about that, and, uh, you know, it's interesting to see how God works through those particular uh, pieces of Scripture. I, I want you, you know, men want God's blessing. We all want God's blessing, don't we? But they don't want God. Men, you know, when tragedy or trouble strikes, first person they call out for is God. They want his blessing, but they don't want God. And God, you know, the desires, God's gift, God's comforts, God's physical healing, God's material blessing, those are the things they want. They rather have that having a desire for personal, intimate relationship, that's what God wants from men. That's what God wants from each of us, is a personal, intimate relationship, not just what's up here. It's got to get down to here. And that's God's desire. Look at Psalm 73. Psalm 73, 
<clears throat> and uh, here, David, David, uh, David looks at the lifestyles of those he's he's lived around, and uh, and what he is doing, he he sees them prospering and becoming envious of what appears to be their easy lifestyle. King David's getting interested. You know, he's looking at that and saying, wow, what a nice lifestyle that is. How often, how often do we take a look sometimes at what others are doing and we kind of get gathered into that spot? You know? And... uh he took his eyes off the eternal and fixed them upon the temporal. David took his eyes off the eternal. What's going to happen in eternity? And put them on what's now. God wants us to have an intimate relationship with him. And I'll tell you, if it's just intellect, that's going to happen a lot. Because if it's not here, and it's only here, Satan gets into our head. And we see things the opposite of how God sees things. Look at, look at verse 17 in Psalm uh, 73. Verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Until David went to church, when David went to church and he started to refocus himself on God and the eternal, then he understood the end of those that were prospering now and what they're going to have later, which is what? Nothing. That doesn't go with us. That stays here. And that's what David said. Steve Sanchez interpreted this, interpreted David saying in this passage, wow, all of the things I could have in this universe, I have God. All the things you can have in this universe, do you have God? What in the world could top that? He's all I need. If I have him, what else matters? Right? What is your most burning desire? Think. What is my most burning desire? I can tell you my mother-in-law's most burning desire, Audrey, she wants to go home. She wants to go home so badly. In 1996, a young Marine corporal named Joe, Joey Mora was standing on a platform on an aircraft carrier patrolling the Iranian Sea. Incredibly, he fell overboard. His absence was not known for 36 hours. A search and rescue mission began, but was given up after another 24 hours. No one could survive in the sea without even a life jacket. After 60 hours, his parents were notified that he was missing and presumed dead. The rest of the story is one of those truth is stranger than fiction events. Script writers would pass, pass it up as not believable. Four Pakistani fishermen found Joey Mora about 72 hours after he had fallen from the aircraft carrier. He was treading water in his sleep, clinging to a makeshift flotation device he made from his trousers. 
a skill learned in most military survival training. He was delirious when they pulled him into their fishing boat. His tongue was dry and cracked and his throat parched. Just about two years later, as he spoke with Stone Phillips of NBC Dateline, he recounted the unbelievable story of will to live and survival, who would not give up. He said it was God who kept him struggling to survive. His discovery by the fisherman makes searching for a needle in a haystack a piece of cake. The most excruciating thing of all, Joey said, that one, one thought that took his body and pounded in his brain was water. Was water. He had a thirst that motivated his every action and that he lived for. David says in 42, 1, 2, and A, he says, A deer panteth for flowing streams. So pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. That was David. You know, if someone was to ask you, God, what is he like? What would you say? How would you answer that particular question? And so the question comes, from where do we learn about God? Well, obviously, we learn about God from here, right? From his holy word. This is how we learn about God. But let me give you a warning. This is an important warning. Listen to this. Just because you might be better informed in respect to who God is does not does not mean that you know him any better. We can have all the intellect in the world, but that doesn't mean that we know him any better. There is a difference between knowing about someone and knowing that person personally. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and so and so Thenius, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints with all that in every place called upon the name of Jesus Christ the Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing God is about the intellect. Knowing God personally is about the heart. It's a relationship. And having a relationship knowing God is why we were created. I mean, we've, we've gone back to Genesis a lot with Pastor Paul, so I'm not going to go back there and look at the creation of man and of woman. But think about that. God created Adam. And then later he put him to sleep and he pulled out a rib and, and put his, his body back together again and formed from that rib a woman, Eve. And why did God create Adam to begin with? What was the purpose for that? It was about having that fellowship. It was about having that intimate relationship. That's why God created Adam. And look at his response in verse 3 after they ate of the apple. And they had that knowledge and they wouldn't hid themselves. And God was walking. <laughs> this, when, you, when you think about this, 
Don't you want to just be in that place for a few minutes? God was walking in the garden. He was walking. He was on earth, walking in the garden, looking for his friend, his buddy, Adam. And he called him, Adam, where art thou? And Adam steps out from underneath the bushes and says, Here am I. We hid ourselves. God's looking, why would you hide from me? Because we were naked. And then God looks and says, hmm, what have you done? You know, that, you know, what was the sin? Satan, Satan tempted Adam and Eve in what way? About knowledge. He says, oh, you surely won't die. God just doesn't want you to be as smart as he is. Knowledge. All the way back there. And uh, I believe, there's, there's no doubt, God wants us to know this book back and forth. Doesn't he? He wants us to understand. He tells us to study, to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. He wants us to understand this word. But he recognizes knowledge just goes so far. It's about that intimate relationship that he wants us to have. And um, we, all, we all have, I mean, I have relationships, you have relationships, whether they're friends or they're cousins, relatives, Grandfathers, mothers, dads, good friends. And, and some, you know, you might even have a knowledge of people who you've read about. I, I, I love American history. And I love reading about the people in American history. The most, my most favorite person that I read about is Abraham Lincoln. I just love reading about him and his life and all that he did. He's one of the most favorite piece of people I've read about. But I can't claim to have a relationship with Abraham Lincoln. I don't have a relationship with him. I know about him, some things. I don't know everything about him. And I definitely don't have a relationship with him. The same thing is with true with our God. The exact same thing is true. If all you have done is just read about him or heard about him in church, you come every Sunday morning, you sit in church and you listen to what pastor is saying about God, and then you go home, you close your Bible, and you put it on the shelf, and you don't do anything else. That's not going to help you to know God. It takes a relationship. I met my wife in March. Actual date was uh, March 3rd, 1972. I'll never forget that day. I was, I was visiting Grace Bible College with a friend who had been dating Polly. He used to play drums for the Shoreward Quartet. And uh, he was leaving the group. So he needed somebody to bring him down there to help pick up his drums. So I said, I'll take you down there. And so we stopped by Grace Bible College. I had no idea what the place was. I was a Pentecostal at the time. I was saved in the Assembly of God Church. And I was a little more than a a year old as a Christian. And uh, I was sitting in the lounge, and back then, honest to God truth, I had hair. <laughs> it was long. It did. I had long hair, and I was sitting in the lounge, and uh, I had a jean jacket on and with some jeans and, uh, and this cap. Uh, kind of one of those old... Greek hats, but it wasn't a Greek hat. It was a, it also was a jean cap. 
you know, I like jeans, I guess. But anyway, I was sitting in there, and a couple guys, uh, one guy was named P.S. McCann, and the other guy was Tim Heath. They were walking through, and they saw me sitting there, and they came over, and they were sitting down, and all of a sudden, they started sharing the gospel with me. And I thought, this is good. <laughs> so we talked for a little bit, and I told them that I had been saved, and they asked me how, and I told them, and I told them what church I was attending, and told them why I was there. Well, anyway, they left. And so I'm still sitting in the lounge waiting for my friend, Steve. And in walks this girl. Cute thing. <laughs> Most beautiful eyes I've ever seen. You know, and uh, so that was the beginning of a, of a long, long, long relationship. About a little over, you know, 1973, November 10th, Paulie and I were married. But through that period of time, it wasn't just about knowledge, but we had, we grew into a relationship. And we had some struggles. And uh, in fact, the day that we actually decided to go together was a day that we almost broke up. Polly had come up to visit, uh, visit me at my home. We went to my church and there was an evangelist there at that time, and he was speaking about people who divide up the Word of God. <laughs> and Polly, being much stronger in the Word than I was at that time, recognized, and she recognized the church and what that church meant for me. Um, my family was a dysfunctional family. They had gone through a terrible divorce. And my brothers and sisters were in foster homes, and I lived with an aunt and uncle until I graduated. And I was actually planning to go to North Central Bible College or Evangel Bible College in Missouri, which are two Assembly of God co colleges. And uh, I wanted to play football there. And... Uh, but anyway, we, I was taking her home, and she says, you know... I think this isn't going to work. Um, did you say good for her? Yeah. Shame on you. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Nick, I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> anyway, we went and we drove home, and it's about 50 miles, 55, 60 miles from uh, uh, Kalamazoo to Grand Rapids, and... Uh, we talked and we went to a place and we parked and we talked some more and talked some more and, and, and understand I had already spent a day with Vernon Schutz where he walked me through the entire Bible understanding dispensationalism. I didn't understand it. And Tim Heath, a wonderful guy, gave me Baker's Dispensational Theology book to read. You know, he's like, yeah, but I, you know, I did read some of it. And, uh, but I told her, I said, you know, I have been praying about this and I've talked to my pastor, my youth pastor, and I'm going to leave this church and I want to go to a grace church. So then she says, okay, <laughs> we can go together. <laughs> That's not what she said. <laughs> but anyway, that was the day in which we started uh, steady dating. And so... I just want you to see knowledge is one thing, but having that relationship is something else. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse, verse 15 through 19. I'm going to read to you two of, of Paul's prayers in the book of Ephesians. And in chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, for mentioning of you in my prayers, that the God of our love, Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, 
the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to working of his mighty power? You know, there Paul is praying about us to have wisdom, or the Ephesians to have wisdom and knowledge. And in verse 17, he prayed that the Holy Spirit would work in the lives of the Ephesians and lead them to know God. And, uh, uh, you know, Mike did a wonderful study, you know. Guys, if you can make it out to Wednesday night Bible study, please try. It is an amazing, amazing time of fellowship, an amazing time to grow in the Word. But Mike was speaking last week, and uh, Mike, you shared a word about to know God. What was that word? Epikinosis. Epikinosis. I can't say that. <laughs> Mike is my personal Greek lexion. So if I need answers about a word, I call Mike. And uh, so thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. But so there is that word, and it's talking about knowing God. God wanted them to have a deeper, fuller way. He wanted them to have a more intimate relationship. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 3. And I'm going to start reading in verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened by the might of his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your, in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And then four, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of your vocation, which ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, long suffering forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. These two prayers, these two prayers are, I believe, the most important prayers that we can pray. That we can pray. And that we can pray for our brothers and sisters in this church for. This is my prayer that we all would be able to have what he says there in verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That is my prayer. Paul prays that we would be strengthened by his Spirit and the inner man. And reading and exercising, how do you do that? You do that by reading and exercising your faith. <laughs> you know, Joe McGarvey a couple of weeks ago, and I can't remember exactly how he said it, but he talked about this knowledge that oftentimes we grace believers get caught up in. And uh, I can't remember what he said, but I'll never forget what Finley Hunter said. Finley Hunter says, Oftentimes, as believers, we get all we can. We can what we get, and then we sit on the can. <laughs> we don't exercise it. 
we don't put it into practice. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about. He's saying being rooted in grounded love. And look at verse 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. God wants you to have a deeper, a fuller relationship with him. Not just head knowledge. He wants you to have heart and he wants you to have so much of it that it blows up inside of you that you can't keep it within. That you want to go out. You want to share it with others. And yes, how do you do that? Well, we share it through the, his word, through the truth that's in here. But we do it through love and understanding. That's the relationship that he wants us to have. His, his love is based on God's relationship of his will in our lives today. It's based upon his, on his will. And the first important element of any relationship of love is, is of an intimate relationship is love. And we know that by looking back at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. I'm not going to turn there. But it talks about the love that he had in providing Christ for us. Is there any greater love than that? No, absolutely not. And in 1 John, turn, turn if you would, please. I, I, these are really good verses, and I... I, I really want us to, to take a look at it. First John chapter four, verses nine and ten. Here he says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And then in verse 19, we love him, we love God. Why? Because he first loved us. This is the relationship he wants us to have. God is the creator of love. He is the ultimate person of love. And, you know, I, when I think about it, it is his perfect love that makes all the difference for us. God's love is in the purest form. It's unconditional. It's unconditional. <laughs> Hard to believe, but it's unconditional. It's undying love. It will never, ever go away, no matter what you do. It's an undying love that came through us through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection that followed. We are undeserving recipients of his perfect, life-changing love. And scripture calls that type of love grace. That's what scripture calls that. He calls it grace. This is God's kind of love. Now turn back to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. And I'll close with this. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Oops. Um, and verse, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, 
but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth we know, we know man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new create, create, creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to, by, him, by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word, the word of reconciliation. And then verse 21 says, For he hath made him sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made in the righteousness of God. The world is savable. That's what that says. The world is savable. That's why we're here. He's given us the, many of, the ministry of reconciliation. And, uh, you know, he has entrusted to us his love. Do we get that? That's entrusted to us. That's why we're here. It's entrusted to our care. He has entrusted us his spiritual and special blessings. Now, we can go back and look at uh, Ephesians. Just turn to Ephesians real quickly. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Do you, do you realize, I know it's been a long time, but pastor spoke on this, and I, I'll tell you, I have encouraged him and encouraged him to write a book on Ephesians. Because that study on these spiritual blessings was the most amazing study I have ever had. I love that study. And, uh, you know, look at, look at verses uh, 13 and 14. Here, here's, here's the best of all of them. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, Ye were sealed that the Holy, with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until redemption. You know, when you buy a house, you have to put down earnest money. That's so that you're, you're keeping your promise. You're going you're gonna to follow through on the contract that you're talking about. So you give earnest money. This is God's earnest money right here. When we were saved, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of our redemption. You know, this was probably the, one of the biggest things for me to understand when I was an assembly of God, when I was a Pentecostal, because they don't believe in eternal security. It was later in my second semester of grace that I had a practical theology class with Jim Carlson. And he was teaching on this passage. And I went and I had a discussion with him in his office. I said, you've got to help me understand. I said, I'm attending a Bible college. And some of the music I hear people playing in here, uh, I don't, you're telling me they're saved? They haven't lost their salvation because that's not the music that is pleasing to God. I know. I was there. I've been there. And when I see people going in and they say they're Christians and they're drinking, I used to drink. I was close to being an alcoholic when I was 17 years old. 
Now, you can't tell me they're Christians. And he took me to, to Romans chapter 8 and went through Romans chapter 8 with me. He says, do you believe the scriptures, Randy? Do you really honestly believe that this is God's holy word? He said, yes. So we read those passages. And he went through Romans 8, 38 and 39. He says, now, what is it that you can do to lose your salvation? And I was sitting there, I said, nothing. He says, you can't do anything. That's exactly right. You are sealed until the day of redemption. Finally, a truth that I struggled with finally came into clear. But, you know, this is just the most amazing piece. You know, we, became, we, have a new, we are new creatures. We have a new man. We are created in Christ Jesus because of his death, burial, and resurrection. Another blessing of God's love is the gift of life. And uh, we could have a more triumph, intimate relationship when we realize we can have a deeper relationship as we grow in his love. Get, it's not just in your head, folks. It's got to be in your heart. You've got to have that intimate relationship to know, to truly, to truly know who God is and experience all that he wants you to experience. Your relationship, you have a relationship with God, no doubt about it, or you wouldn't be reading his word. But do you want a fuller relationship with God? Do you want one that is deeper in knowing God? That takes an intimate relationship relationship, not just an intellectual relationship. It was Paul's prayer for all of his converts, and it's Paul's prayer for us. As we grow in our love for him, his love becomes more abundant. He wants us to have a greater insight in just how much he loved us. Next week, I'll be uh, speaking again, and I'm going to continue on this theme of knowing God. And we're going to talk about the position that we are in in Christ. And then the following week, the last week that I will speak, we're going to talk about knowing God's will. Do you know that in the Word of God, we often ask, what is God's will for my life? You know, Do you know that in this Word, in this Word, you can start out by knowing God's word, by knowing the absolutes in here. There are absolutes that God tells us, this is my will. This is my will. Do this. You know, what a flash. You know, I'm sitting there, I'm going, really? I mean, there are times when I've taken a job and I thought, Wow. Is this truly the will of God that I'm here? In Alabama, where it's so hot, and I'm a sweater? <laughs> really, God? <laughs> this is where you want me to be? <laughs> it was at the time. And we had a great time there. Develop. Brothers and sisters in Christ, take time. Develop that intimate relationship with God have that deeper, fuller relationship with him that he wants to have with you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. And I just pray, Lord, that uh, you are honored and glorified by what was said and done. And uh, Lord, I, I pray that uh, your spirit will encourage all of us will help us to see the importance of having that intimate relationship with God. We know it's more than intellect. We know you want us to love you better. You want us to have that relationship that continues to grow deeper and deeper and deeper. Give us strength, Father. 
Give us encouragement. Help us to encourage one another and to share that love that you have given to us with each other as well. Help us to keep the spirit of the unity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you for watching this episode of Grace Bible Church's Sunday morning worship service. If you'd like to contact us, please write to us at PO Box 3025, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, 54903. Or you can visit us on the World Wide Web at www.gbcoshkosh.org.